Peace. Good evening. Welcome to Concord Baptist Church Bible study once again. It's Monday, the 20th of April. We're going to be looking at the chemistry of the conscience and uh, what the conscience is, what the conscience does, who has a conscience and who doesn't. Amen. Um, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Grace, Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, as we come boldly before thy throne of grace, Father, to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you're doing. Lord, I pray for our country. I pray, Father, that you would let people wake up and see how our liberties are being eroded, Lord, by the, the governors of the states. And uh, Lord, I understand we have to use common sense and that we have to try to stay the plague, so to speak. But, Lord, I think they're going a little bit too far. I think they're enjoying the power grab. And so I pray that you'd wake up the people of America. And, Lord, let them see, the what, down, see what road we're headed down. And, uh, Lord, that they would turn to you and repent. And, Lord, that you would restore our freedoms again, the liberty that we have in you. Lord, in this country again. Be with us now as we study thy word, and we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Girls, sing a song. When we walk with the Lord in the Trust and obey for 
Kobe. Amen, girls. Thank you. All right. Tonight we're going to be uh, looking at we're going to be looking at uh, the chemistry of the conscience. First, I wanted to. Uh, play a song for you by Billy Kelly. We were a little unprepared here for a little bit this evening. We waited to the last minute. We were, we got home from work and we realized we needed to cut the grass. So I knew if I came in the house, I wouldn't go back out. So I jumped on the lawnmower and we run around the yard and cut the big section. Then we grabbed the push mower and went around and get the sard to get sections and came in, jumped in the shower and uh, came out and began to study. We didn't get the old pass done uh, this end of last week, like we were hoping to. And so I started writing my article and, uh, studying some scripture and next thing you know about an hour and a half later the powers of darkness came upon me so I had to lay down 15 minutes but anyway I'll play a song here by Billy Kelly and then we'll uh, get into the word <laughs> eternal day. All right. Well, before I get into M.R. DeHaan's uh, 
part of this study, Chemistry of the Conscience. I wanted to read you a verse, at, or a couple of verses out of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. It said, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, or are law unto themselves. He says, which shew the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to Paul's gospel there. He says, my gospel. Uh, you know, I, I use this illustration uh, quite often. I ask the question, who taught you how to lie? And uh, really, nobody taught you how to lie. You knew how to lie. How'd you know? Be well, because it was your nature. Uh, you remember we talked about old Sam the pig and and uh, how a pig just wallows in the mud and he loves it because that's his nature. And uh, you have a nature too. You have a lost nature when you were born because of Adam's sin in the garden. You've got contaminated blood, as we saw in the last study. And therefore, your nature is to lie, to violate every commandment of God. That's your nature, and that's why you need a new nature. That's why you need to be born again. So I used to ask the question, who taught you to lie? No one. Who told you it was wrong to lie when you did lie? I just read it to you, Romans chapter 2, your conscience. You see, the law was given to Israel 430 years after God had covenanted it with Abraham, and it was for them and their worship. We didn't have the law as Gentiles, but God still has it in our heart called a conscience. First time you ever told a lie, you knew it was wrong. I mean, I, can, I can't remember what lie I first told, but I can remember how I felt. When I lied, I got all flustered inside, my face got red, and I felt guilty. But you know, the more I lied, the less guilt I felt. I remember in school and when I was in uh, junior high in Masontown, Pennsylvania, we did some things, got in some trouble, and we were called into the principal's office and, and uh, he kept asking us questions. I kept lying. And he said, Townsend, you can lie with a straight face. Well, that's because I'd gotten pretty good at it. My conscience, the law in my heart that said, thou shall not lie, had become calloused. Now, I've worked with my hands all my life. And I've got some, I don't know if you can see it here. It's hard to tell, but there's calluses on these hands. And I can pick up something that's hot that my daughter couldn't pick up. Why? Because her hands are still tender. But mine have become calloused and I can handle a little more heat than she can. Well, that's what happened to my heart. The more I lied, the more I exercised the, myself in lying, the uh, more calloused my heart became. Pretty soon I could lie, wouldn't bother me a bit, like some of you. Uh, I know a young man that worked for us. That boy can lie. I mean, he'd convince you if you didn't know better. I remember my daughter, Tabitha. One time I came in off the road and had a little clubhouse in the backyard. And she was, uh, I was looking through the crack of the door or the window. I can't remember exactly how it was now, but I remember looking in there and seeing her. Uh, I think she was about four years old and she had an onion in her hand. I guess she had taken out the house and she had found a piece of aluminum and she was trying to peel that onion. And uh, 
Anyway, I was standing outside there and I had my hands behind my back and she walked out and she looked up and you could see the shock on her face and she put her hands behind her with that onion. I said, she had a speech impediment when she was little and I said, what are you doing? She said, nothing. I said, uh, nothing. She said, nothing. I said, you weren't by any chance peeling an onion, were you? No, and I really mean it. <laughs> she was lying through her teeth. And we had to go around for quite a while. And uh, anyway, what happened? She, how'd she know how to lie? And, and why did she get upset when she came out and saw me standing there? Because she, knows she, she knew she did something that she shouldn't have done. And her, her own heart condemned her. And so as we got older, the more we did the things that we shouldn't do, the less it bothered us. And that's why God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. He said the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Now, he said the law, Paul says the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Well, in the New Testament, we're not under law, we're under grace. So how do you use the law lawfully? Well, as a schoolmaster. When the preacher takes the word of God and he says, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not steal, thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I mean, as he does this, the law begins to convict you and it starts to cut through them old calluses that you had built up around your old heart, that your conscience had become numb to. And that's why people get mad. And that's why people don't really want to go to church. Uh, lost people really don't like being at church because their sins are found out. I've had people come to church and, and they thought that Somebody had told me about them because what I had preached was hitting them. And I didn't even know them and nobody told me anything. I just preached what I believe God put on my heart that day. And it pricked their heart. Why? Because God's word is alive. He said, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So it was the word of God convicting people of their sin. Now you'll do one or two things. You'll try to find a cure for it, which is the blood of Jesus Christ, or you'll try to cover your sin by good deeds, religion, or number three, you'll just not come to church anymore, not want to hear the preaching. Now, when you get to that point, God begins to harden your heart. He'll turn you over to a reprobate mind for you not like to retain the things of God. So when we get over here to the chemistry of conscience, Mr. DeHaan says this, a great deal of interest has been awakened in an invention of recent date called the lie detector. I remember one time we were applying for a job with a trucking company, myself and my friend, Fred Davis. And uh, we had to take a lie detector test. Well, I failed it. And I did tell a lie. But they put me in this room, set me in this chair, and the room was blank. Uh, and they began to ask me some questions, simple questions, yes and no, and you'd answer them. But then they'd ask me a question, and I lied. And when I lied, my face got red, my heart raced a little bit, and that little machine with the arm on it, with the needle, just went crazy. Well, my friend, Fred Davis, he took the same lie detector test, and he was a good liar. He had gotten to the point that he could believe his own lies. And he could go in there and take that lie detector test, and they could ask him a question, and he didn't have it set in his mind that he really didn't do what they were asking him, and he passed the test. That's why the lie detector test isn't that admissible in court these days. But God had a lie, de uh, lie detector test, and his worked. He says, it is a scientific instrument which is said to possess the power to detect whether a man or woman is telling the truth. It has been subjected widely to rigid scientific 
test and is declared by many criminologists and psychologists to be accurate and dependable. Well, I know that's not true. By others, it is discredited. And in many courts, it has not yet been endorsed. The whole subject is still in its infancy and the doubt and doubts in many minds concerning its practicability are due to the fact that it has not been sufficiently used in actual cases and investigators have not been able to make proper tests. We believe that the invention of the lie detector is the beginning of an unlimited field of research in the matter of criminology and psychology. It can easily be proved to be scientific and based upon well-known and recognized physiological and psychological principles. Well, that's true unless you've convinced yourself. Uh, I know some people that have said some things, told some lies, and they were convinced in their heart. And that's why the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is deceitful. Amen. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And they've convinced themselves that the lie that they've lived or told is the truth. Well, the lie detector will not show that because man can overcome it by believing his own lies. But here, the lie detector in the Bible, the Bible records the use of the first scientific lie detector, whereas the lie detectors now in use in the world are a very recent invention. That was back in his day. The one described by Moses in the word is almost 4,000 years old. He says, and you will find the record in the fifth chapter of Numbers and a study of it will form the subject matter for this message. Bear with me as I try to read this to print small. I'm old. If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him and a man lie with her carnally and it be hid from the eyes of her husband and be kept close and she be defiled and there be no witness against her, neither she, neither she be taken with the manner, of course, caught in the act. And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous, suspicious of his wife, and she be not defied, defiled. Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley, barley mill. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord and uncover her or uncover the woman's head. Now that means they shaved her head, thus taking her glory away. You remember in the book of Corinthians, uh, Paul says that a woman's hair is given her for her covering. I know growing up in the Mennonite church, a lot of the women, uh, and they still do today, would wear this little covering on their head. And uh, of course, I don't know how they uh, got to the point where they misread the scripture because the scripture says that the woman's hair is given her for a covering. And that's why it's a shame for a man to pray covered. In other words, with long hair. Long hair is a shame unto the man, the Bible says. But anyway, they uncovered her hair. They shaved her head, thus taking her glory away and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causes the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, if no man have lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from the bitter water that causes the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some men have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among the, thy people. When the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that causes the curse shall go into thy bowels, to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book 
and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causes the curse. And the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take an handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterward shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, it shall come to pass that if she be defiled and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thighs shall rot. And the woman shall be a curse among her people. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. In other words, if she hadn't done anything, if she's innocent, then nothing's going to happen. We know that this record is the inspired word of the living God and no true child of his doubts for a moment that the test really worked when it was applied. But the question is, was this a test that depended upon the supernatural for its working? And was it one of those miracles which served only for a season? Or is there a scientific basis and foundation for the test apart from the miraculous? And will it work today? We believe, although we would not detract a whit from the miraculous in the Bible, that this test did not depend upon a miracle at all, but was a normal physical test which depended upon the ordinary physical and psychological functions of the body. We believe that if we knew the identity of the bitter herb which Moses used, the same test would work today. Recent discoveries in the realm of physiological chemistry and psychological effects on the body will greatly strengthen this position. The lie detectors we have today depends upon the fact that certain psychological and emotional changes react upon the tissues of the body and cause specific changes in the physical functions of the organism. A normal emotion resulting in a peaceful consciousness of innocence will produce either no change or a different reaction. An abnormal emotion or emotional state caused by telling a lie, especially under oath and with the danger of detection, will cause certain other changes in the muscles and secretions, which when tested or measured could tell us whether there is present an abnormal psychology caused by a sense of guilt or fear or a normal emotion change brought about by the consciousness of innocence. Now there's people that still have a tender conscience and you could go up to them and if they're lying, you could confront them with it and their face will get red. Their eyes start twitching. Amen. Uh, that's good because it means they haven't been hardened yet. Investigators have discovered that when a man tells a lie, certain emotional changes take place which react upon the effect of the heart and the blood vessel and cause a change in the blood pressure. When a man is telling the truth, his change is absent. But when he is under abnormal emotional presence, pressure of telling a lie, the change is noted on the instrument which records the fluctuations in the pressure of the circulation. A little thought, I am sure, will convince anyone that this is neither impossible nor contrary to ordinary physical facts. Blushing. Blushing is a reddening of the skin, especially of the face and neck, caused by a sudden dilation of the peripheral blood vessels and is accompanied by a sensation of heat. This physical change is caused by an emotional or psychological stimulation. The emotion of embarrassment causes a physical change in the body. The emotion of fear causes the face to turn white, the very opposite physical reaction of embarrassment and blushing. Great expectation or surprise produces tachycardia, that's a rapid heart, increased respiration and deep 
sighing result from other emotions. You ever been burdened by something and you're sitting there thinking and all of a sudden you just go. <sighs> My wife all the time asks me, why are you sighing? Sudden surprise and fright may cause vomiting. Anguish may cause one to sweat. Fits of anger often result in apoplexy and death because of the sudden increase in the blood pressure which they produce. In the realm of hysteria, we have an inexhaustible field. In the realm of sex life, we have another realm which has scarcely been entered by modern science. But we trust that the above examples are sufficient to prove that emotional changes and physiological stimuli do affect the heart, blood vessels, secretions, and in fact, every organ and tissue in the human body. The mere thought of food is sufficient to cause the mouth to water, which of course is simply the evidence that a salivary glands have been aroused to, that's what I said, salivary, my wife's correcting me while I'm trying to do this here. Glands have been aroused to secret, secretary activity by a pleasant thought. Jealousy offering. The test prescribed in Numbers 5 is based on the preceding scientific facts that were given to Moses by inspiration and anticipated modern science by 4,000 years. This particular lie detector, which Moses used, utilized the principles in use today. The subject must know that the test is to be applied, usually is administ administered under oath. He must be impressed with the certainty of the results and the dire consequences consequences if he's found guilty of the crime and lying under oath. The story as we have it in Numbers 5 is very simple. In the case of a man who had become suspicious of his wife and was jealous of her, the following procedure was inaugurated. If there was no witness to the sin and no direct evidence was available, the woman was taken to the priest and her head covering removed. A jealousy offering was brought to impress the woman with the gravity of the situation, which required an offering. It was probably designed to induce her to confess her guilt in case she was guilty and accept the offering for her. If she did not confess, she was put under oath. The priest then told her in a great detail just what would happen. He was going to give her a drink of bitter water. It was water containing some kind of herb or drug. And she was informed by the priest that if she was guilty and lied about it, this potion would act as a violent poison, causing per peritonitis and gangrene and ultimately death. If she was guiltless, it would not affect her. All this was very, very impressively done so that the person being tested could not fail to realize the importance of telling the truth. You can imagine the nervous condition of the individual after this ordeal. Boy, I'll tell you what, if we had that test today and could give it to lawyers, <laughs> That's why they want the Ten Commandments taken down from the courthouse. Could you imagine a lawyer walking in and every time he walked into the courtroom, he looked up and saw the Ten Commandments, said, that shall not lie. <laughs> well, anyway, once more, the priest stated the facts to the woman. He described the consequences which would follow if she lied and the freedom from penalty if she told the truth. Then the woman repeated the oath and said, amen, amen. So be it. She was then given a bitter cup with the testing drug. Invariably, the test was successful. If she was guilty, she dreaded inflammation and gangrene resulted. And if she was not guilty, nothing serious ensued. We do not know what the drug was, which Moses used. If we did, we should have something far better and surer than the modern lie detector. But like the Egyptian formula for embalming and other arts, the formula is lost and we may never find it. But the scientific basis is not in any way undermined by our ignorance of the identity of the drug. Well, I tell you what, if they had that drug today, there would be a bunch of women running around with rotten legs and swollen bellies, wouldn't there? <laughs> oh, well, just a little joke there. It is well known in certain emotions and nervous disturbances result in a change in secretions and functions of the body. A baby has the colic the colic because the mother had a fit of anger. There were produced in the body of the mother certain potomians or alkaloidal poisons as a result of her disturbed emotions. 
and these were transmitted to the babe in the mother's milk. We know that in the same way, emotions and nervous disorders result in the poisoning of the system and the throwing off of products of incomplete combustion. Many cases of so-called dipsyria, dipsyria are purely nervous origin, yet there is a chemical change in the secretions of the stomach. Many cases of antioxidation result from the same cause. Well, I've seen I've gone a little bit over tonight, but uh, when we come back tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, uh, we'll be picking up where dishonesty poisons, dishonesty poisons. I hope you uh, learned something. You can go back to the scriptures there in Numbers chapter 5 and read it for yourself. Uh, I know firsthand that when you lie, you can get flustered. I don't know about you, but my ears turn red. I mean, they start flashing like stoplights. My face gets red. I get embarrassed. But it used to not be that way because I became such a professional at lying that it didn't bother me anymore. And that's what that principal told me when I was in school. That's a shame to say that. But you know, God wrote his law in your heart. You knew it was wrong when you did it. Every young man knows when he took a young girl up in the parking place on Lover's Leap or somewhere in the back of his car, they knew it was wrong. First time you stole something, you knew it was wrong because your heart condemns you through the conscience that God put there. What is your conscience telling you tonight? Do you really know the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior? Have you truly repented of your sin and trusted his shed blood? Have you truly been born again? You need to answer those questions honestly. That's why Paul says to examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith. A lot of folks profess that, they're, that they know God, but they have no testimony to show it. Well, I thank you for tuning in. I pray that you'll come back and let me bore you again some more tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. God bless you. Hello to everyone. Have a good evening. We love you. Good night.